You may remain seated. You did a great job on that hymn, by the way. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord of life and death, be with me in the hour of death with the assurance that comes from your conquest over sin, Satan, and death itself. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I don't know how many of you follow football. Some of you probably do. And if I asked you who you thought was the greatest quarterback in the history of the National Football League, you'd probably get a whole bunch of different answers. Your opinion maybe would be different than mine. Some of you might say Tom Brady, the quarterback of the New England Patriots, is probably the best to play the game. Others might say, and I choke saying this, my wife would say this, Aaron Rodgers for, for the Green Bay Packers. My vote would go to Francis Tarkenton, the former quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. Some would say John Unitas. If I was to ask you who you thought maybe was one of the greatest presidents we've had in our country, we'd probably have a whole bunch of different answers as well. Maybe you'd answer Ronald Reagan. Some might say John F. Kennedy. Some might say Bill Clinton. The answers could go on and on. Now I've often wondered what makes people look up to certain people as role models and great examples and people who have done such wonderful jobs. And that was a question that came to my mind as I was preparing for and studying this text this past week about the prophet Elijah. Because this has always been one thing that has surprised me and puzzled me in my entire life as a Christian, going to Sunday school and hearing the Bible lessons, learning about the prophet Elijah. The people of Jesus' time, they considered Elijah to be the greatest prophet that ever, ever graced the land of Israel. The greatest prophet to ever grace and to minister to God's people. And as I thought, you know, and as I heard that because every time they would talk to Jesus, you know, the name Elijah would come up. You know, they would say, Jesus thinks he's Elijah. Others asked Jesus if he was Elijah. And there were some reasons for that because Elijah led a unique life in ministry. Did you know that Elijah never died? He was taken from this world in a whirlwind, taken straight up to heaven. He didn't taste death. Nobody know, you know, we were told that the prophet Elijah, his successor, watched him being carried off. And in some Jewish legend, they were always waiting for him to come back. Maybe, and that was probably one of the reasons they asked Jesus if he thought he was Elijah. When he was on the cross, and Jesus cried out the words in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Jewish leaders said, listen, he's calling Elijah. They mistook those words, my God, my God, as for him calling out for Elijah. They thought he was the greatest, and that amazed me because... There were other great prophets, probably, in my opinion, more prominent than Elijah. The prophet Moses. He was the one who gave the God that God handed down the Ten Commandments to on Mount Sinai. He was the one who led God's people out of slavery in Egypt and led them through, through the wilderness to the Promised Land. He was the one who wrote the first five books of Scripture which was called the Law of Moses. And it was even Moses who said that there was going to one, be one who comes after him just like him, as he was talking about Jesus. You think about other prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, we hear about him all during the season of Christmas. And even during the season of Lent, as we hear him giving some of the most clear promises and prophecies about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his birth, his sufferings and death, 700 years before Jesus even stepped foot 
physically on this earth. The prophet Jeremiah. The wailing prophet. The grieving prophet. The one who gives many promises of comfort to God's people. Words that we often hear our pastors and fellow Christians give us when, we, when we're going through difficult times. And the list could go on and on. Why Elijah? I think, there was, I think there were many reasons. And I'm not saying that Elijah wasn't afraid of God. I think we can see some of his greatness here in, in our text for this morning. I just want to give you a little bit of a rundown besides what happened here. Okay? Elijah, when he comes on the scene, when God calls him to be a prophet, all of a sudden he's there. He appears before wicked King Ahab and his wife, Queen Jezebel, king and queen of Israel. They were leading God's people into idolatry and encouraging them to worship false gods. They were even killing the true prophets of the Lord. God sent Elijah. He comes out of nowhere. Just says where he's from. We don't know how old he is. He's just there. And immediately God sends him to this nut, King Ahab. And he sends him with a message. A message that there isn't going to be any rain that falls on the land for three and a half years until God gives Elijah the word and it, then it will return. This sets Ahab off on a tangent. Elijah flees. God sends him to, out into the wilderness to a brook and to a cave and there Elijah is sustained by, by bread that's being brought by ravens and he has water there to drink in that brook. And then... God sends him here to this woman, to this widow in the town of Zarephath. A place that was really in Queen Jezebel's backyard, kind of hiding right under the queen's nose. His wife is in danger every single day. This woman wasn't considered, or wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have uh, at least thought she was a believer, but she didn't know who the true God was and had a weak faith. After this whole incident, then God sends him, and you might remember that Bible lesson about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and they build the altars, and God sends fire down upon Elijah's altar to prove that he's the true God, sends Elijah off to, to go uh, and kill the prophets of Baal. After that, the rain comes back, but Elijah, or the prophet, or actually, I'm sorry, King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, makes it her mission that she's going to kill Elijah. He's got to go into hiding again. He considers himself to be the last prophet, one of the last of God's people left. He goes into a depression. He's in hiding on the side of a mountain. Up and down, up and down. This was a difficult ministry. And so as God sends Elijah here to this woman's home. I see so much of God prepping Elijah, ministering to him, strengthening him for the mission that's to come ahead, for all the garbage that's going to come up. Things are going good. He sends Elijah to this woman's home. Maybe you remember the, remember the account. Elijah comes, he sees this woman, she's a widow. She's got a little boy. People are starving. There's a famine in the land. There's no rain. And he comes up to her with a strange request. He says, go and make me a cake of bread and then make one for you and your son. She's looked at him and said, are you crazy? We're starving. We only have one little bit of flour left to, to make that and then we're going, that's it. We're going to starve to death and die. Elijah said, don't worry about it. Go ahead and make it anyway. First make me my meal, then you can make yours. If that request was made to me, it would have been a really nice reply. But that woman did that. Then she made her and her son's meal as well. And what happened after that was a miracle. There was always that amount of flour in that woman's jar always that same amount of oil in that container. And that woman was able to feed 
herself and her husband, or her, her son, and the prophet Elijah for three years. A miracle. I can't imagine what that was like, you know? For that woman, as she would be in the kitchen and taking it out, and there was always food in there. That had to have been something for the prophet Elijah as well. To see God sustaining him, to see God sustaining his life in the midst uh, of death. People were dying of starvation throughout the whole country. And God was keeping him alive, miraculously. <clears throat> Things were going good. And then we get to our text. We're told that that woman, who had her only little son, that son died. He got sick and he died. There was grief beyond belief in that household. That woman lost her child. I was just talking with someone this past week. As uh, we, you know, when we look at no, par every parent knows it's not natural that you bury your child. And this woman, as she's going through her grief, she goes to Elijah. And she says, what is it here? What kind of type of curse have you brought upon me? You're a man of God. Have you done something that has upset God that he's taken my son? This has got to be your fault. She was pointing the finger at, God, at God's servant and at God himself. You know what? And I, you know, I'm not going to excuse what she said and what she was thinking and not call it sin, but you know what, I can understand. I know what grief and loss and death do <clears throat> and the thoughts that Satan brings to our mind. And the first thing is, is we start looking at God and saying, how can you do this to me? How can you abandon me like this? How can you take this person from me who is so important to me? That happens with each and every one of us. That's one of the stages of grief. What kind of surprises me, and it shouldn't, because I've gone through this as well too, is the reaction of the prophet Elijah. He doesn't say much to the woman, but he takes her son, takes him up to his room where he was living in, lays the boy on the bed, and then he stretches him out, and then he prays to God. Which is what we all have the privilege and the blessing to do when even in times when we're not going through trouble. But then Elijah says, in effect, this to the Lord. He says, Lord, my God, please let this, this life, this boy's life come back to him. But before that, he said, Lord God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow I am staying with by killing her son? Listen to that again. Lord, have you also brought tragedy on the widow I am staying with by killing her son. I can tell you in my ministry, in well, my past, you can call me a New Testament prophet, one who speaks God's word like Elijah did. I can't count the number of times in my ministry to the Lord's people as people have gone through death and sometimes something is so tragic, something is so sudden, the death of that person, that person is so young, or maybe even it seems sometimes that families, it's like they go through one tragedy and then they get hit with another. And as I talk to the Lord in prayer, I'm guilty of what Elijah does here. Maybe you've even uttered these prayers to the Lord too. Lord, do you know what you're doing? I can't count the number of times I have sinfully said to the Lord in my prayers, you know, that family has really taken it really hard, Lord. You think you could let up on them? Is that natural too? Yes, but it's wrong. Who am I? Who is Elijah? Who are you or who are any of God's people to question his wisdom and his works, when he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, when he makes the promises, 
all things work for the good of those who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. When we hear the promises of God uttered in that Old Testament believer, Joseph, who could see in the midst of hardship, when he said to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but the Lord intended this for good, the saving of many lives. Who are we? But in the midst of all of this difficult difficulty and this hardship, the Lord was strengthening Elijah. Scripture tells us, Jesus himself tells us, that if we want anyone who wants to be his disciple, we take up our cross and follow him. Here's an instance where Elijah was taking up his cross. And even then, son's mother, that widow, that widow woman. Through difficulty, the Lord brings us through those difficulties to strengthen our faith, to lift up our eyes to Him, to rest our faith on Him, to trust in Him. And God strengthens us. He was doing it for that woman and for Elijah, both for the woman, for the one, the believer, the church member, so to speak, and for the pastor. It's amazing. Because as Elijah uttered his prayer, asked the Lord to raise him, what happened? The Lord brought that little boy back to life. Elijah brought that child down to his mother and said, see, your son lives." Can't imagine the joy that was in that woman's heart. Can't imagine the joy that was in Elijah's heart as he saw that miracle that the Lord had worked through him and through the Lord's powerful word. And what does that woman say? She speaks out and she says this, now that I, now I know that you are a man of God and the Lord's word from your mouth is true. That's a powerful confession of faith. Yes, this woman had had her son given back to him, her son, to her, alive. She was grateful. But notice why she was grateful and she saw what was, she saw what was being done here. She saw the Lord's hand. She saw the power of the Lord's word because again she said, I know you are a man of God and that the Lord's word from your mouth is true. That had to have been something that just struck Elijah's heart. Because he saw his faith was had to have been strengthened as he saw this woman's faith strengthened through the Lord's work, through the Lord's word. This beautiful confession of faith, these beautiful words of thank ministered to Elijah as well. And I can't tell you, brothers and sisters, how many times as I come to minister to you, to your loved ones, and I often wonder, what am I going to say in these difficult times? What am I going to say? What part of scripture am I going to use to bring you God's comfort? What am I going to do or use to dry those tears and to give you strength? And I fret about that. Worry about it. And then when I get there to begin ministering, so often, you end up ministering to me, at least I feel more than I minister to you. As you quote God's promises to me, as you hold up his faithfulness in his word, as you cling to your Savior in faith, we get to see God's work so powerfully at, at, in action among one another. Elijah got to see it. You and I get to see it. Every time we come here and we hear about our Savior, if we hear His promises, we receive the forgiveness of sins. As we receive Jesus' body and blood of the sacrament, as we remember our baptisms, leave our sins at the feet of Jesus and walk living, immersed in His forgiveness, holding on to the promise of the resurrection to eternal life, that because Jesus lives, we too will live, not only in the future, but here and now, 
with his promises that he will lift us up, that he will sustain us, that he will bring us through this veil of tears to the glory of heaven. What a great promise that is. You know, and as I look at the prophet Elijah, you know, there may be others that did a whole lot more fancy things than he did. There may be others that, there were others that wrote books of Holy Scripture, words that you and I have committed to memory, words that you and I hold dear. Men like Moses, Elijah, or Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, Malachi, all those prophets. But you know what? Where I see Elijah's greatness here is his reliance on the Lord. His reliance on the Savior. His reliance on His Word. And that's where we find true power, true, true strength, true comfort. Because all those things hold our Savior clearly before us. Sure, all the prophets did that. But I think that's one of the reasons that many of God's people considered Elijah to be the greatest. Because he clung to that power, clinged to that powerful Word pointed people to their Savior. That's what makes a person a believer. That's what makes a person a person of faith. That's what great faith is. Jesus often commended that, among others that he saw that in. May God grant us such a faith as this, that we hold to our Savior tightly, because we know he will never stray from us. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join me in singing The Created Me. You can find that on pages 12 and 13 in your bulletin.